A huge thanks to Brian for sponsoring this video. <laughs> video! A few days ago I opened up my new store Stemmage EU where we sell a lot of very cool handcrafted things like those tensegrity tables and the like. So if you haven't checked it out already please do so it would really mean a lot to me. Thousands of men powered hours went into the creation of this shop and the product so yeah check it out and maybe there's something in there that you would like too. Link in the description stemmage.eu. So today I would like to talk about something that um, might seem kind of counterintuitive and probably your physics teacher and professor always told you that mass is never a time dependent variable. But this actually isn't true. Mass in physics can be time dependent and maybe you have heard of the rocket equation before. This is one of the instances where we have to deal with mass which is time dependent because a rocket is losing some part of its mass over time in terms of fuel being um, turned into steam and the like. Okay, and we can actually do the same for many other systems. For example, just take a look at this pendulum right here. This pendulum is swinging regularly, but it's losing its mass over time because water is leaking out of the pendulum. And we can, for example, assume that we are having a sturdy string, okay, and down there as a mass is just a hollow sphere or whatever the fuck I don't care and water is um, basically leaking out of the um, yeah of the mass down there letting the mass go to zero overall and this is what we are going to talk about let us talk about this pendulum for example as a system which is actually time dependent on mass so let us draw the sketch um, let's say up here we are having our um, ceiling and then we are going to have our pendulum. Then we have the hollow sphere with a certain mass m and it's going to leak um, what it's inside over time. Okay, really doesn't matter. And we also have the regular stuff with an angle phi which is going to trace out an angular momentum and the like. And once again our mass is time dependent. And now we are going to try to find the equation of motion for all the equations of motion for this pendulum right here. Now let us take a look at what we have. I mean we have some certain angle phi which is going to change over time. We have our mass which is also time dependent and also we have some kind of radius, the length of our sturdy string which we also take as a given but this doesn't change over time. This is why I said we are using a sturdy st um, string. It really doesn't change its length over time. Otherwise the system would explode in variables and would get arbitrarily complicated. Now we are going to try to find out the Lagrangian of this whole thing. I want you guys to remember what the Lagrangian is. It's just the difference of the kinetic and the potential energy. And at first we are going to find out the kinetic term because this is basically the harder part and we are going to try to find out the harder part at first. Now the kinetic energy is defined as the mass over 2 times our basically velocity vector squared. This is our um, just simply our kinetic energy and we can pretty easily find it out. So at first let us find out what the r vector actually is. The r vector is going to tell us where our mass is going to be all the time in the system and it's going to consist of some kind of x and y coordinate. Now what are those x and y coordinates exactly? I mean if we were to trace out a tiny little coordinate system into here. Let's say this right here is going to be a triangle where our r is going to be our hypotenuse and let's just say that the origin of our coordinate system lies up here where our pendulum is attached to the ceiling for example. Then what we have down here is some kind of x coordinate and what we have here is the y coordinate. And now we can just start using trigonometric identities. I mean what we know is that x over r is nothing other than the a sign of alpha. Meaning overall if we were to solve our x coordinate we know that our x coordinate is nothing other than r, the length of our string, times the sine of phi. Same thing with the y coordinate. The, um, our cosine of phi is nothing other than y over r. Now we can solve for just the y coordinate giving us r times the cosine of phi. Yeah and I want you guys to remember something our variable phi is with respect to t. Meaning if we were to differentiate our vector now, meaning we are going to find the differential of our r, 
We are going to differentiate point-wise at first, meaning we are going to take the time derivative of r times the sine of phi at first. r is not time dependent, we can bring it to the front and now we are going to differentiate sine of phi with respect to time. Now we need to use the chain rule here. At, at first the outer derivative of sine is going to give us um, the cosine of phi. And now we are going to take the inner derivative. The inner derivative is just the time derivative of, of our phi, giving us the angular momentum overall, not the angular momentum, um, the, the angular velocity, I'm terribly sorry, which is going to be nothing other than phi dot. And the same thing applies here. We are going to get r, the derivative of cosine is going to be negative sine of phi times phi dot. And yeah, this is basically it. And now we can start squaring our um, derivative vector um, r. And yeah, it's pretty easy um, to, to square this thing. It's just a scalar product. Basically, if you multiply a vector by itself, it's basically just a scalar product, meaning we are going to square our entries that we got here and we are going to add it together. Meaning overall, if we have r dot squared, this is just going to be the first one squared. So r squared times phi dot squared times the cosine squared of phi. And then this um, part squared is going to give us plus r squared phi dot squared times the sine squared of phi. Now you might notice that r squared times phi dot squared is a common factor. We can factor it out. And what we got here now in parentheses is cosine squared plus the sine squared. And this right here is nothing other than 1. Meaning it unfolds very nicely. Our kinetic energy is nothing other than the mass with this with respect to t, okay, don't forget that, over 2 times r squared, which is not with respect to t, times phi dot squared. And here, yeah, this right here is our kinetic energy. Now what about our potential energy? Our potential energy is just being defined as m with respect to t times the gravitational acceleration, g, times the height where our mass is in the system at all times. And since our pendulum is hanging in the downwards y direction, we are just going to take our y coordinate that we got here with a negative sign in front because you know we got a negative potential energy. It's underneath our coordinate system's origin basically in the y direction. Meaning negative the y coordinate is r times the cosine of phi. And this is basically it. Those are our two energies which we can now take the difference of. Meaning our Lagrangian overall is going to be t, so m over 2 times r squared phi dot squared and then minus and minus is going to turn into a, neg uh, into a positive sign m times g times r times the cosine of phi. And this is our Lagrangian, very nice. And now what we need to use are the Euler Lagrange equations to basically find out the equations of motion. Now the thing is Basically, what we got here are two generalized coordinates. Those are all the coordinates or all the variables in our system which are time dependent, which are going to change over time. Those are going to be our phi and our mass. One of those two really doesn't make too much physical sense in my opinion, at least. Um, I couldn't in interpret it nicely, but we are still going to write it out. Let us start with phi at first, because this right here is going to be the easier one to interpret and to find the equations of motion to. So, so at first, just as a little reminder, the euler lagrange equations tell us that the time derivative of the um, partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivative of our generalized coordinate, uh, one of the two in our system, is equal to the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to our um, with respect to our generalized coordinate. And that's what we are going to do. At first, we are going to plug um, our phi into our q, and after that, our m into our q, giving us two maybe coupled. Um, equations of motions overall. So let us start with the right hand side. What about del phi of l? I mean if we were to differentiate this whole Lagrangian with respect to phi, this part is going to vanish because this is just with respect to phi dot. It's not with respect to phi, it's going to vanish. Then we are going to get the derivative of this part with respect to phi, giving us negative um, m times g times r times the sine of phi. Okay, this right here is the first part, very easy. Now what about the time derivative of the differential 
um, of our generalized uh, of our Lagrangian with respect to the time derivative of generalized coordinate. I never know how to say this part because it's kind of a mess to say, to be honest. So Andrew Dodson, if you're watching, please tell me how to pronounce this shit right there. Okay, this right here is going to be the time derivative of. Now we are going to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to our fat dot. I mean, the second part is going to vanish. It's not with respect to fat dot, it's only with respect to fat. Now this part right here, we are just going to use the power root, dragging the two to the front, cancelling out the one half, giving us m, with, which is with respect to t, don't forget that, times r squared times fat dot, which is also with respect to t. And now what we are going to do is we are just going to differentiate this part right here with respect to t. Now we need to make use of the product rule. So at first let's differentiate the um, mass part with respect to t, giving us overall um, r squared times the mass differentiate with respect to time times fat dot. And then we are going to differentiate our fat dot with respect to time. So plus m times r squared times fat double dot. Meaning overall the first equation of motion that we get, so we can just subtract one part to the other side, is going to be the following one. Namely that r squared times m dot fat dot plus m r squared fat double dot is um, plus, if we were to add this on both sides, plus m times g times r times the sine of phi is equal to zero. This right here is the first equation of motion and it already looks rather terrible. You can divide both sides by r squared, for example, giving you a slightly nicer expression. But this is what we got. This right here is the equation of motion for basically the pendulum which is going to lose its mass overall. Next we are going to find the equation of motion for our generalized coordinate, the mass. And for this we are just going to plug m into this differential equation and see what we are going to get out. Now I want you guys to notice something if we take a look at our Lagrangian that we got right here. We really don't have anything with respect to m dot. Meaning this whole part is going to vanish in the Euler Lagrangian equations. Meaning for the mass the only thing that we need to consider is del m of the Lagrangian which is equal to zero. Meaning if we were to differentiate this Lagrangian with respect to m, what we are going to get out is that zero is hence nothing other than. Differentiating this is going to give us just r squared times for dot squared over two. And on this part we are going to get g times r times the cosine of phi. And this is the part where I said it really doesn't make any sense physically, at least in my opinion. Maybe someone could um, teach me the ways down there in the comments. If we were to solve for our angular velocity that we got here, what we need to do is we at first need to subtract this part, okay, giving us a negative value here. Then we need to divide both sides by r squared over 2, still giving us a negative value over here. And if we then take the square root on both sides to find out what the angular velocity is, we are going to run into a tiny little problem there because we are going to get an imaginary angular velocity out, which doesn't make too much sense in my opinion, but maybe there's a physical reason behind that. Maybe it does make sense and I'm just being stupid here. But this second differential equation can actually help you um, solve this first differential equation because those two can be coupled. But if it doesn't make any physical sense whatsoever, then I don't know if this leads to the right solution. But we'll see in another video probably. Leave some comments down there below and tell me a few insights if you know a bunch more. And this basically concludes today's video. And if you did like what you saw today, then I invite you to try out Brian, today's sponsor, who are kind enough to sponsor yet another video here on this channel. If you're not familiar with Brilliant yet, I'm going to give you a short and spicy introduction. Brilliant is your source for some of the best online learning content that you can find out there on the internet. Doesn't matter if you want to learn something about physics, mathematics, chemistry, computer sciences. They definitely got you covered with nearly 70 interactive courses. And what really makes Brilliant shine are their interactive courses. And it's really a plus to work for their interactive courses. It's a very good experience and if you haven't tried it out, you should definitely do so by using the link in the description. It's really one of a kind of experience in my opinion. So they guide you through those new exercises that you have never heard of before, those new topics in mathematics or maybe Lagrangian and, and Hamiltonian mechanics. Starting you off with very easy facts leading over from New Newtonian mechanics into those constraints that you got here, generalized coordinates, building up knowledge over time, leading you to harder and harder exercises which are going to open new gates for you. And next to their crazy good explanations that you can find, so if you get something wrong, 
really doesn't matter, it's okay. You can still take a look at the right answers. They also provide you with those very, very good animations, giving you a, a real in intuitive understanding of what you actually did there. Why Lagrangian mechanics works the way it does? Why can you use something like a Lagrangian to find out the equations of motion instead of using the Newtonian formalism. All of this will be covered over on Preint and many more. So if this feels like it's something for you, if I piqued your interest, then definitely make sure to try out the link at the top of the description, preint.org slash fandlemaps. With it you're going to get free access to a big portion of Brilliant already and the first 200 people to actually make use of the link at 20% of an annual premium subscription which is really great to considering how much content they have available on their website and also how many courses they add over time. So yeah the premium subscription is really worth your buck. You're literally never going to run out of, of content ever. So really takes a while to work through everything. So try it out and support the channel this way. If you did enjoy today's video, please make sure to look over to Stimwich EU and see if you can find something that um, you find nice. And other than that, you can support the channel on Patreon and Teespring, etc. But most importantly, please stay safe during Corona and have a great one. Ciao!